How do you approach a job that requires installation of new hardware? Do you measure, diagram, and write a plan? Or do you just wing it? What resources do you have if you've never done something before? Even if you have prepared yourself on paper, how do you cope when the job goes all Monday on you? And when a customer walks into your shop and wants to buy a handle, do you just sell them a handle? Today, we will answer a few of these questions, probably ask several more, on the podcast by Locksmiths and for Locksmiths. I'm Tim Coleman, and joining me today are Tyler J. Thomas, Jeff Moss, and guest host Jason Cornell. This is The Three Tumblers. Even the most timid and mild-mannered of locksmiths get asked to make fresh installations. Yes, I'm speaking to you, semi-retired, residential-only guys. But even a run-of-the-mill fresh deadbolt installation requires some forethought and planning, right? After all, a double-wide trailer door drills a little different than a $6.2 million condo door. Maybe you don't have the tools for the job, you don't work on doors, or there's just no market for it. The point is, a locksmith should be prepared for either or even both or all of the above situations in the same day. You know, I think that the first time I heard of a locksmith saying they they don't work on doors, it was kind of foreign to me because I wasn't a locksmith then. And when I became a locksmith and and started working as one. I realized that working on doors is probably 98% of the entire job. You know, you have to address the entire opening and there are tools for those jobs. You also, like we talked about a couple episodes ago, you also have to be prepared to help those customers in a way that you know, what they want. So Jeff, let me ask you this. When you hear a locksmith say, I don't work on doors, excluding locksmiths who are in the shop or 100% automotive only. uh, When you hear a locksmith say, I don't work on doors. What are your first thoughts? Well, I mean, that's really not something I've heard. You know, we're not carpenters. We don't hang doors. We don't really do fresh installs of doors and frames but we'll adjust hinges. We'll make sure that everything works. So it's sort of like, I don't know that, that, I didn't know that that was a thing because if you're not saying you don't work on doors means what? You won't drill the holes for the deadbolt. You won't do anything except the lock. You know, it, it, like you said, our responsibility is to make sure that the opening is correct and secure. But at the same time, we do continuous hinges, but we don't touch glass or the actual door you know we're not we do not go out and install brand new doors but we'll cut in latch locks we'll cut in you know we'll do uh that sort of work so it's not that we don't do them it's just in my frame of experience it's just we do not supply brand new doors is is i guess where we draw the line well what about doing a uh, strike alignment you know, if if a deadbolt's hard to turn, you know, the strike needs to be adjusted. Do, do you guys do that? Or do you do, like you said, you did continuous hinges and stuff like that. That's working on a door. Right. Uh, so, you're not, so I guess I'm confused by the question because it's not something that I've, I've really experienced. Someone saying, no, we don't do doors. We just do the lock. Because that would be saying, like, we don't do tires or we do tires, but we don't do the rest of the car. <laughs> if right if you put the tire on yeah so it, it's really a non-issue but saying we we do again we do not supply brand new doors we repair existing stuff we don't mess with glass but we do everything else i guess but in general you do work on the existing doors yes okay you know, maybe right. for one or two customers we will facilitate ordering the doors for them to install because it's more institutional stuff. We're not ripping frames out on a daily basis and, and doing hollow metal doors or anything like that. So the, I guess my point was the working on 
an existing door, adjusting strikes, you know, tightening the hinges, adjusting the hinges, etc. You know, locksmiths who say they don't do that, they only do the hardware on the door. What what would your opinion be of those? I would say that I've never experienced that, but that would be foolish because it really, if your lock is going onto a door that doesn't lock or doesn't, you know, doesn't secure properly, you're not doing the whole job. Tightening things and making sure things work is just like 101. It takes 30 seconds to make sure, you know, the screws are tight. Uh, on the hinges and things like that. So yeah, what, anybody who wouldn't do that, I think they're doing a disservice. You know, you got to do the whole job. Right, exactly. Uh, Jason, when you work on a door, whether it's an installation or a, you know, just adjustment or s hardware swap out or something, how important is it to have the right tools to do that? Uh, well, I mean... You see me work. I've gotten away with not having any tools and gotten the job done. Touch base on your your previous point before I get into this. You get a, a call for you know your deadbolt not locking for not locking for the strike alignment. Um, don't go there and relocate strike because that's really not the issue. Of course, it's the door. Um, look at your hinges. Look at the frame. Make sure that's right. But make sure you have the right tools. Uh, I mean, yeah, especially if you go to an installation. I mean, if you want to sit here and tape on paper templates and hope you've got everything square on both sides, accounting for bevel on beveled edge doors, blah, 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 it's time consuming. Um, you know, you can buy jigs for pretty much any hardware that's on the market. Um, some of them are relatively, relatively inexpensive. Some of them are quite expensive, but the time savings and pretty much guarantee that your hardware is going to go exactly where it needs to be is priceless. Um, as you know, in our shop, we have probably too many jigs for everything other than closers. <laughs> um, but it's a lot faster with tape measure. I can put them in in five minutes. So, yeah, I mean, but I mean, even if, if you were to see a, uh, a locksmith video, I don't know if, if you have or not, or if you've, talk to a locksmith that has said oh yeah i got this you know plastic install jig that clamps on the door and i only spent 50 bucks on it on amazon and that's really all you need uh what would what would you say to that or or locksmiths who still use like the little edge template that has little notches for your your back set your your center for your uh uh through through bore and a little notch for your back set for your uh, cross bore in the door. Yeah, I mean to each their own. Um, you know, I prefer using uh, a jigs because it's more reliable, I and mean, all our jigs are steel. Um, I've used a couple of plastic ones in the past, and you can't crank them down tight enough. And you know, if you're doing a cross bore, your whole saw is going to move that thing. Um, I actually uh, was in Charleston, South Carolina about a year ago um and i forgot to bring a jig to install a lock on my son's house so we ran to one of the hardware stores and bought the dewalt milwaukee whatever brand plastic kit it was that was complete had the whole saws and everything else in it put it on the door it didn't, didn't even get a half a turn on the uh, whole saw and it slid across the door scratch his paint up uh needs to say i made a second trip down there to fix that door and install it correctly and actually had to change the design uh, so it covered up the scratch I put in the door. That's, that's when you uh, took my truck down there and drank all the water and ate all my snacks, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. Save me $30 at Exxon. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, so when, when a locksmith really doesn't want to do anything more uh, than just hardware swap outs or whatever and you try to discuss with them and say look you know you can make more money doing installs you can make more money if you have the tools to do it and they turn around and they say well there's just not a market for it i mean you know there's always a market to do something isn't there yeah unless you're in bumfuck nowhere trying to do commercial and there's no commercial buildings around i guess but a lot of time what they're saying kind of under the table is they're really not comfortable doing it and they're looking for an excuse not to do it at least in my experience 
But when the opportunity is around, there's always a market for something. Exactly. So if, if uh, say this Reiki only quote unquote locksmith has a really good customer that they do a lot of Reiki's for as a commercial customer and they, the customer says, Hey, we want an electronic keypad lock on our employee entrance door. Do you think that, you know, there, there's that un, uncomfortableness as far as the locksmith installing that lock on there? Because just because they're not familiar with it could be it could be that what they're doing now is lucrative enough that they don't want to buck the trend and they're happy and content with what they're doing and maybe don't want to get involved. Yeah, I guess, like Jason said earlier, teach their own that that's what they want to do. But uh, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. Obviously, we're not jumping to do access control or safes or anything. We just we've got our little niche market that we we focus on. And I really don't want to touch anything else because it's it's paying the bills pretty well. Good point. All right. Any other points? Jeff? Well, go just ahead. Say, there's no such thing as too many tools. Exactly. I mean, hey, Jason, how many tools do we have in, in each truck? Uh, individually or, I mean, the doubles and triples of everything? Just just on average, if, if you were to pull <laughs> one of our trucks open. <laughs> um. Well, I, I don't know if I could give you a number, but I could tell you weight. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and if it's not in the truck, we have it in the shop, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and then probably three or four of each tool in the shop, and probably the same quantity at my house. Um, I'm coming to visit. <laughs> yeah, it's like a hardware store in here. Like I said, you know, it's you. I'm kind of getting into it later, but uh, you know, being prepared, having what you need is great. As always, I always forget everything. So I go out there and say, yeah, we're ready to do this job. And I go, well, shit, I left this at the shop. I left that at the shop. I left this. The, this is in the other van. So why don't I make it work? Exactly. We've, we've been there a couple times before. All right. So if we didn't hurt your feelings too bad and you're still listening, up next, Tyler's going to throw us a little lifeline that is often ignored when it comes to installations. know that you have the practical skills to perform a job but maybe you don't have the experience of fully planning for it or maybe you are just looking for some good pricing on parts who do you turn to some jobs can be pretty daunting to locksmiths but there are useful assets available to you for free they know the hardware installation requirements and can help guide you with the selection so why don't more locksmiths utilize their manufacturer and distributor reps and I don't mess around much with Facebook groups anymore, but you would be as astonished how many locksmiths don't realize that distributor reps and manufacturer reps can do more than answer phone calls or emails. They'll actually go out and spec a job for you, with you. Granted, it's got to be more than maybe one door, although I guess some would do that. But, you know, if, if you're interested in trying out a new product line or Maybe you already set up with a new product line, but you've got your first big opportunity to quote a job with it. Uh, they'll go out there with you. You just give them a call and say, hey, I've got a 25, 50 door job. This is my first time working with this product. Really could use some guidance. You feel comfortable enough to go out there and helping me. And yeah, they'll always do it. I remember when NDE first came out, we did a 25 door job. Uh, but I had questions as far as the gateway, as far as navigating certain wall structures, whether the signal would carry. And I had a, a Schlage rep come out there, well, an Allegiant rep, and uh, he helped me spec the job, tell me exactly what I needed. And it gave me a lot of guidance and information that I use for NDE jobs going forward. Uh, but that sort of stuff was invaluable. And again, it was free. Uh, Jason, you've got some experience working with reps as far as quoting jobs. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, we've had quite a few jobs that um, just due to size, I've I brought in either or both of our distributor and our uh, manufacturer rep, um, you know, a large apartment complex for an access control. And it was kind of the same situation you were talking about, you know, not actually engaged, probably another product, but it was more of the the layout and 
what we're going to need uh any particular products that might be involved in doing something this large because we've never done one that had so many doors um are we going to need a, a different type of software the software we always sold going to be able to handle you know 500 users and you know 160 doors we did a church that i did a walkthrough for and it was 108 doors i think you went on that one with me once tim uh did some repairs but just so far this year we've quoted three or four different apartment complexes uh, and i've involved both the distributor um for their input and definitely my sales reps uh just for one to make sure i'm quoting all the correct products but also to verify the products were even available and what my timeline would be to order those products if they said hey you know we we approved your quote we want to have this done by april 15th well it's going to take me six months to get my product i can't meet that deadline so you know having representation through your distributors and through your manufacturers is a must for any business um especially in ours jeff you're not necessarily out on the field most times i know you went out this week to help with some uh, continuous hinges but do you ever have to interact with a distributor or manufacturer rep maybe not necessarily to facilitate an order but perhaps to answer a question or solve a dilemma and, and find the right solution for it? Every day, just about. We have a very good supplier for our automotive stuff, and they will take the time to go back and look at what they have. And literally, do we have it on the shelf? Will it work? They'll send pictures. I mean, these guys, you know, there's, there's good sales reps, and then there's really good sales reps. You know, there's also the ones where you have to worry about if you tell them who the job is for, that they might try to sell direct to them. I've heard enough horror stories about that. You know, we don't really have that problem, but I've heard a lot of it from other locksmiths. Um, you know, not so much on the manufacturer side, having to call, but, you know, having to call tech support occasionally. But with the distributors, you know, like you give them one number and they said it was discontinued. And I looked a few minutes later and it was a different number for the same lock, but in a different finish which they do still have, but they had to order it in from another branch. I don't know that I should have to do all that legwork necessarily, but it really was five, 10 minutes at the most. So it's like, okay, no problem. They'll get it from their sister company and uh, not a huge deal. But no, I mean, they, I would say when we need something, you know, something big, we'll call in like the Allegiant rep, you know, for doing some new key system stuff that we weren't, that wasn't a hundred percent clear on some big jobs and, not necessarily having them go out to the customer, but just to make sure that we know exactly what we need to have. And uh, our, in fact, those those guys are good from a legion. Anytime I need information or some, they always know to bring swag. That's important. I mean, keep us happy and selling their stuff. Checks in the mail. Tim, we've talked about the implementation and the planning phases, but after it's been deployed, you've got to support whatever you install throughout the life of the system, be it key system access control. How does a rep from a manufacturer distributor play into that in form or in the form of a supporting role? Well, I mean, what I've found is that you can install a system, whether it's, you know, like you said, access control, a key system, whatever you install it and you get called back to the customer three, four weeks later, and they say, hey, what you just put in isn't working right now, or it's not working correctly, or, you know, this wasn't like this right after you put it in, but it's like this now. And so going back to your rep is kind of your lifeline for troubleshooting. You can say, hey, I haven't had this problem. You know, I didn't have this problem when when I set this system up, it worked fine. Customer was happy. And now a month later, they're having issues with this. And if you've got a, a like, like Jeff said, you know, you can have a, a good rep or a great rep and a great rep is going to stay on it and get you in touch with exactly who you need to be in touch with because that rep wants you to sell more of that product. But I mean, furthermore, they, they, you know, they're going to be there and say, Hey, I talked to another logsmith that I sold this product to before and 
they were having the same issue. This is what they wound up having to do. And maybe you can try that. So it's kind of like you get feedback from the field, people who are actually out there touching the door and installing the stuff. And then they can turn around and say, this helped so-and-so uh, when they installed this product and had this problem. Yeah, act kind of, sort of acting as a liaison between all the locksmiths in their district or their area and, and can help relay experiences. Up next, our guest host, Jason, is going to tell us how sometimes the best laid out plans still require, and I love this, locksmithing the shit out of something to make it work. Welcome back. Um, on some jobs, you may have immaculate planning and schedules and documentation for every individual installation. But usually, on the first and last door of the job, you have to take all those plans, wad them up, toss them in the shitter. But how do you cope with the changes on the fly? What resources can you turn to? And how can you not lose more money on an already pain in the ass job? I can tell you uh, on a job that Tim and I just did recently. Um, we were replacing a discontinued Monarch exit device with the new Falcon design, and I made the mistake and ordered the wrong part. So we had to put the old part back on the door. That didn't work. Anytime you turn the key, it uh, would bypass. It wasn't lining up, and it wouldn't unlock or lock the door. So I had the smart idea to use a piece of fiber card that you use for like dead latch bypass and basically made a washer to put on the, um, I guess, active stem on the device and tightened it up so it wouldn't slip anymore. And it actually fucking worked. Um, so yeah, that was locksmithing the shit out of that door uh, last minute on the fly. Uh, on location. What do you got, Tyler? Yeah, uh, kind of having to deal with what you're talking about as far as discontinuation. Uh, some of our key systems are 40-something years old and have to deal with locks that have long since been discontinued, trying to find a way to acquiesce with the changes in hardware, crafting tailpieces, cams, shit like that. Um it's a pain in the ass, but you got to do what you got to do. You got to locksmith the shit out of it, huh? Very true. I've made quite a few custom cams in my day. <laughs> um, how about you, Jeff? What, uh, how can your assistance in the shop with uh, coordinating, you know, uh, getting job parts together and, you know, getting how, how do you go about putting your plans to help the guys that are on the field? Like making sure what cams and tailpieces they need on things labeling putting things in envelopes you know going through we usually don't get a hardware schedule but just going through the keying and making notes and making sure the biggest thing is a lot of times we go through stuff and somebody needs a key for this office and all the the person did was put the date and so i try to get as much information as possible as to where something is going so that in five years it doesn't still just say used so that at least we know it's office 125 and Tyler, you have a very good method uh, for that if you want to share real quick. Uh, uh, we assign every lockable opening in any facility we service a four-digit number that's uh, on in a sticker that's on the, either the top or middle hinge. And that sticker gives us a DHI uh, door description to and from, stuff like that, uh, the type of hardware on the door, usually in the model number, finish, key set assigned, and then two other fills that we usually reserve for uh, the last invoice to touch it. So that's how we're able to keep up with all these systems. Uh, like I said, one of our biggest customers has been a customer since the eighties, 85 was when the first system was installed uh, across six buildings. And we've still got great notes that help us and almost never run into to issues because we're just so dead set on taking notes, keeping notes and, and being a pain in the ass as far as telling customers, Hey, if something changes, even it's, it's, you know, a door getting swapped down, a new door, you got to tell us. So how much stuff is actually on the label though? Is it just like a number and then you cross-reference it? Right, with our software. It's saved in our software. And um, 
that yeah it's a four digit number and then there's a, a disclaimer it says don't remove it I, I really need to change it to seriously don't fucking touch this because we just spec the job and the they're they're doing their punch list at this time so they're going through they're wiping everything down cleaning it all up getting it ready for the customer to move in and they fucking took off every single label so now we've got to go back and resurvey the job and uh and more money in my pocket where they threw all the hardware away oh yeah well i I just fired them recently so that's taken care of yeah we just did uh, a job from one of the local cities and contractor installed all the levers and then threw away all the drive actuators for the ICs. So we had to order in 50 so we could finish the building. That always happens. That's <laughs> Oh yeah, oh, every time. If a contractor is installing hardware, there's something missing. Uh like the bottom rod off an exit device, um just cuz they didn't want to put a hole in the concrete or, you know, cut the tile. Yeah, happens all the time. Tim, question for you. What do what do you do to keep sane while you're out on the job? Well, I've got you on speed dial for first thing. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I what's, think what's that my common answer when you call, what do you want? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, honestly, I think that, that when you're out on a job and you have, you have something that's not working and you have to think outside the box, honestly, I, I, take a step back before I call you, I take a step back and I say, what would Jason do? And <laughs> you know, what would he at least say? And then what does that fire? And I think about, you know, what has Tyler said? What has Jeff said? What, is, you know, what have other locksmiths that, that I've heard of say about this? And you just have to take your time, step back. You know, if you have to walk away from the door for a few minutes and just think about what's going on, if it's really that frustrating, then, you know, do that and collect your thoughts. The other thing is when you know that you're in over your head, call for help. And I know that some, you know, like one man show operations out there, you know, locksmiths who are mobile only, they work by themselves and for themselves. Uh, they don't always have that option, but they, they should have somebody that they could call. You know, several locksmiths that call you for help uh, with stuff. You know, just just back up for a second before you plunge headlong into a complete fuck up and you wind up having to buy a whole brand new door. <laughs> Very true. And I've been doing this for 33, 34 years. And I still have people that I call. Um, just ask questions. Hey, before I fuck this up, man, is this how this is supposed to go? Or, you know, what steps should I do? Cause this is what I want it to do. And then, you know, sometimes they get my answer. Sometimes they throw their hands up and go, I don't know. Let me know what you figure out and call me back. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's um, the best, like, you know, the, what is it? The best laid plans. How the hell does it say go? Best laid plans always fuck up. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'd agree with that. <laughs> So when we get back, um, we'll shed some light on how shopsmiths play a big part in hardware selection and sales. Almost all of the time, when a customer walks into the shop asking for a door handle, we have to pry a lot more information out of them in order to sell them the hardware they need. Sometimes a knob is just a knob, but sometimes a handle is just a handle, but you should always know the difference, even if your customer doesn't. I mean, generally speaking, I get asked at least every other hour for a regular lock or a regular door or, you know, some sort of tumbler. Um, I know a lot more now than I did five years ago as far as functions and handing and, and what you can do and what you can't do. You know, so I think being educated is important, knowing that some stuff is okay for residential, but not for commercial. Always getting pictures from the customer is very important. Making sure that they actually take usable pictures because I've had people like get you like just the dial of a safe or something, which really doesn't help because you can't see the rest of it. Um, or they just send you the edge of the door and think that it's good enough. Um, you know, just communicating with them, you know, 
sometimes you got to dumb it down. You know, guy came in, he said he wanted two locks keyed up to the key that he brought in. Okay, well, then where are the keys that came with the lock? Well, you said you just wanted a key to your key. But yeah, but it comes with two keys. No, you, unless you have a master key system, your key, your locks are only going to work on the one key that you asked us to key it to. Oh, okay. You know, it's like having to triple communicate things uh, sometimes just so you don't end up doing the work again for free is important. Um, there's plenty of catalogs. There's plenty, you know, having the internet to show exactly what this trim is going to look like if we order it or what color, whatever. You know, again, go reaching out to your reps to get like sample rings with the different trim finishes are helpful. You know, most of the displays that we have are just standard finishes for the most part. You know, just being able to show them something as close to what they're going to get uh, as possible, especially when you order something with a lead time and it may not be returnable and then you're stuck with it for 20 years. So uh, Jason, you've been doing this a long time and I see you nodding. Uh, give me your uh, thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you touched a lot of points, but to, to kind of expand on those, um, you know, having to dumb it down for your clients uh, is, is a big point. Uh, you don't want to drill them down or bore them with, technical data and terminology because they don't understand it. The biggest thing is, is more of just listening and trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish. And that's usually how I go about it. They come in and, you know, oh, I need a lock on my door. Okay. What kind of lock is this for interior, exterior, you know, get past that. Okay. This is what you want. Okay. Now you're looking for just keys or do you want electronics? Okay. You want just keys. We're going for there. Then, you know, what's the color? It's like pulling teeth. Um, you know, you you reference automotive quite a bit, and we get the same thing. I think you guys have mentioned it in uh, previous conversations that people call up. Oh, I need to keep my car. How much is it? Yep. Well, let's start off. What's year, make, model? What's the location? Do you need a copy? Did you lose them all? Because yeah. they don't know what information you need, so you just have to be patient and work your way through it, and know how to ask the right questions. Because not every customer is going to react the same way. Um, you ask them what color, and they're going to say, oh, I don't care. Well, what do you currently have? Is it is it gold color? Is it brown? Is it silver? Is it blue? Is it black? Is it orange? Whatever. Mm. Um, and they're like, well, I don't care what it is. Do you not want it to match? You know, they don't think of these things. Um, and then you can offer them better products. You know, here's their good, better, best situation. Um, and let them make the decision. Don't just say, this is what I sell. Take her to leave it because um, some you're probably going to drive away more clients and you're going to keep with that sales point. And Tyler, you're the keying expert in my eyes. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you, yeah, you, you learn, I guess. At, well, if you only do one thing all the time, you get really good at it as far as understanding what people mean, kind of translating it and at least formulating the right questions to ask them to steer them in that right direction. So I guess I'm fortunate in that regard. Um, but yeah, you, you can do a lot if you kind of, you get so hyper-focused, it just becomes second nature. I don't know. That's all I can offer, I guess. <laughs> and Tim, Mr. Finish and Feature, what do you think? Well, just to uh, kind of refer back to what Jason was saying, you know, as as a cop and especially in 911, I learned how to, you know, question people and how to draw information out and when like you were saying knowing your options available and then being able to question your customers will allow you to offer a better selection of whatever it is they need so you know asking them you know a for pictures like you said pictures are are worth way more than a thousand words in this industry and getting that and if they can't give you pictures or or anything like that you can say okay is it kind of square is it kind of rounded is it fancy is it silver is it brown is it black is it kind of bronzish you know being able to interpret those questions into something that your customer can relate to is very important and i think if you're able to understand customer 
and translate that into hardware finish and trim styles and everything, I think you'll be able to better help your customer and they will be happy with it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, we prefer our customers to be happy at the end of the day. Okay, well, your prayers are answered and we're finally getting near the end of the show. So listen to a few seconds of some free music and then we'll be back for spare parts. Well, we know you've most likely fast forwarded to this part of the show where we talk about random shit that for some reason we remembered at the end of the week. Spare parts, and I'm going to go first. A few weeks, Tyler and Jeff have had a running joke about Jeff. The whole, my name is Jeff thing, and Hefe, they, they may have told me in our group text what the background and reference was for that. I may have missed it. Well, no, I did miss it. Uh, I don't watch movies, especially sequels of movies that I didn't really like the first ones of. So I didn't understand where it came from until last weekend. So, Jeff, from now on, I will be referring to you as 22 Jump Street. That's my spare part. Jeff, take it away. So I know we're not supposed to share war stories, but I was helping on this continuous hinge job and something very important when you unpack the lock, make sure that the guy on the outside of the door has the package of screws. Luckily, there was another door and he was able to come in and get the screws from me. I didn't think I put them in my coat. You know, then we put the door back up. He's like, where's the screws? I'm like, well, they're in my pocket. Well, I'm on the outside of the door, you knucklehead. And the and then he was, uh, when he was using the impact to put the self tappers in, it took him about eight tries to get one screw in. And I was, so I'm on the inside kind of laughing. And so just be careful out there. Glass doors are heavy. They'll move when you're not thinking about it. So make sure that you're uh, not doing anything else and make sure you don't become a spare part. Jeff, that's uh, eight tries is probably three tries better than what it takes me just to drill in a self tapper. Jason, what's your spare part? Uh, yeah, I can relate to everything that's been said. Yeah, I don't even know what the hell I did this week. To kind of go back to um, what we started in the beginning, if you don't know who your manufacturer reps are in your area, find out, man, because they will be more than beneficial to you in the future. And utilize the hell out of them for all their information. And that's about all I got. Tyler, what have you got? Uh, just another example of my life coming full circle. I haven't played video games since I was 14, 15, 16, something like that. And, uh, my kid wanted one, so we got him one. And uh, I got an Xbox being delivered today, so I'm going to get to play games again. So that's pretty cool. It's awesome. I miss my PlayStation. I have PlayStation, Xbox, uh, Nintendo's. We got all of them. I don't play. I haven't played any of them in probably seven or eight years. You don't have time to play any of them. No, I don't. Your, your wife keeps you too busy. That, that, that and the grandkids. <laughs> All right. Well, you've squandered another hour of your precious youth listening to our podcast. Our executive producer is Tyler J. Thomas. Our technical producer is Jeff. My name is Heffy Moss. Our guest host today was Jason Cornell. I'm your writer and editor, Tim Coleman. Our clothing designer is Hugh Jass. And our NASA liaison is Roger Houston. Our chief legal counsel is Hugh Lewis Dewey of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Otherwise known to the kids at the ice cream store, screaming for him to get off the rides as Huey Louie Dewey. Max Headroom. My name Jeff. My name is Jeff. Y'all have a great weekend. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. This has been a Three Tumblers production. Season 1, Episode 7. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. Find this episode and others wherever you get your podcasts.